Hi, welcome once again to Greensburg Glimpses. You know, if you're a regular viewer of this series or of this channel, and you've probably seen a program that we did several weeks ago called Kernersville Cares for Kids. Uh, and my guest on that program was Patty Josephel, who is the, one of the founders of that uh, movement that's done such a great job of reaching kids, in the, particularly in the Kernersville schools and, and spread throughout the Winston-Salem for South County Schools uh, with uh, information that uh, helps keep them off of drugs and, and substance abuse. We found that in that 28-minute program, we just didn't have enough time to get in all the things that we wanted to talk about. So Patty Joe has graciously consented to come back, and we're going to spend some more time talking about some things that we didn't get to before. Patty Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Jay. Yeah. Um, I want to start by asking, I know one of the things that you said you wanted to talk about was the role of parents, and we're certainly going to do that, but I'd like to start by asking you a couple of things that, that really struck me from your book, and you might hold that up, Under the Influence, Okay. Uh, if, if people are interested in that. But So, Under the uh, Influence, the town that listened to it. The town case. that listened to it, right. Yes. Uh, but a statistic, and we were talking about this a little bit before the program, a statistic that really jumped out at me that nearly a third of all girls and 20% of all boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. That's and right. And as a result of that, this sexual abuse uh, leads to greater problems with drugs and substance abuse. Absolutely. What happens, Jay, with sexual abuse, which is becoming epidemic in our society, and what happens is, is it creates within a child, and I know we talked and you've done a youth ministry also, creates an intense feeling of worthlessness, yeah. and the automatic response is self-blame. So this child's carrying around this huge burden of blame and worthlessness. And what it does, it's been scientifically researched, it increases a child's chances of using drugs by 26 times. So a child who's been sexually abused is 26 times more likely to, be, to abuse drugs than a child who's never been sexually abused. Now I like to add a little caveat in there Please. because sometimes parents are like, oh my goodness, that happened to one of my children. If you get professional help, that risk factor can be almost normalized. Mm -hmm. But the mistake parents sometimes make is little Mary or little Johnny seems to be, maybe the abuse happens uh, when they're 11, uh, 8, something, and they seem to be doing just fine, and they say, oh, well, they got over it. And what they don't understand is that these seeds of discontent and these seeds of worthlessness have been implanted in their hearts and they don't come full bloom until a child becomes a teenager. And at that point, that's when all of a sudden the parents say, what's going on? What's happening to this child? And now they're starting to deal with or not deal with or be overwhelmed by the stress of these feelings that have now come full bloom. So it's a, it is a, an extremely serious problem that parents want to get professional help. Well, and not only that, but as you and I were talking, uh, what we tried to do in my ministry was to help these young people see that, look, it's not your fault in most cases, and you can't blame yourself for somebody yes. else's weakness. And, and I really encourage parents to take that approach as well, rather than yes. blaming the kids, to help them see yes. that you know, you're not the bad guy. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, because it's an automatic response, a child has to hear it about a thousand times yeah. to erase that automatic response from their heart and mind. And that's why, just like one of my children needed braces, he had his horrible teeth all every which way. And I did not say, well, I'm the parent. I'm going to get some wire and some pliers, and I'm going to fix your teeth. I knew I needed to get my son professional help. Right, sure. When a child has been sexually abused, it's like an emotional train wreck. There would be very few parents that could have the skills and the, the knowledge and the uh, ability to bring that child through that to where their risk factor was now normalized. So parents can help, but I say be strong enough to admit you need help and ask for help because every life is so precious error on the side of getting help instead of trying to handle it yourself. Yeah, and, and um, I have found over the years that that's one of the biggest problems that many parents, because they feel inadequate themselves, yes. uh, they don't seek help from anybody else. They just, just ignore it and hope it'll go away. And that's yes. probably the biggest mistake they can make. Absolutely, because it, it just does not go away. No, it it has to be resolved. It doesn't, yeah. Yes. Okay, and also there's a matter of depression, and, and you write about that in your book. I believe it was, what, 39% you said of all high school students suffer from some kind of depression. Yeah. Yes. Of course, that's a problem leading to drug abuse as well. Yes, so 39% of all high school students, somewhere between 9th and 10th grade, 9th and 12th grade, excuse me, are going to suffer from mild to severe depression. And the problem is that is that when a child has depression, it greatly increases their chances of engaging in self-destructive behavior. And there's actually been some studies done, and one of them's mentioned in the book, that 
Uh, did it come first, the depression, and they're self-medicating, or did they start taking drugs and that in itself can cause depression? And research says that mostly the kids were feeling depressed first and looking for some escape from this emotional pain, this emotional depression. And so, once again, risk factors can be normalized if parents get their children help. So notice early there are indications, there are things to look for, uh, that your child may have a problem with depression, it's fairly common, 39%, and so get your children help. And there's so much free help available nowadays that it's really not a good reason for parents to not get their children help. Well, part of the problem, too, is, is that parents often are ashamed to admit that they have a child with some kind of emotional problem. They just want yes. to, again, be in denial and they don't get the help that they, that's yes. available and that they should be getting. Yes, and it takes time. Yeah. Uh, when you're taking a child, I've, we've de dealt with depression in our family, and so you've got weekly appointments maybe, and maybe there's some medication for a period of time. Uh, so it's a commitment. But again, every child's worth it because depression is something that you can learn to cope with, you can learn to manage it, you can get on with your life, and if you don't, just growing up, just being an adolescent is hard enough oh, yeah. without some of these other problems sure. uh, that their child would have to deal with. Yeah, if there is such a thing as a normal teenager, it's, it's hard <laughs> enough being, quote, normal without yes. all the other problems. Yeah. Do you think, I don't know how far back your research goes, but do you think 39% is, is, is somewhat high? Do you think it's, it's increasing? Is it higher now than it was? And if so, why? Why do you think that is? Well, I would tend to guess it is increasing. And I think it's increasing because stress on the family, stress on people in general has increased dramatically probably since 911 and then we had the economic downturn we had a lot of people losing their jobs mm -hmm. unemployment uh, was skyrocketing for a while things seem to be normalizing now and, but i think the biggest factor is the broken home the family the ruptured family unit i think probably causes more stress in America than probably any other single problem and i had a statistic that i wanted to share with sure. you if that's okay please uh -huh because this is pretty well documented and uh, it talks about here that um, the risks that broken home students face are staggering. Children growing up with only one biological parent in the home account for 63 percent of all youth suicides, 70 percent of all teenage pregnancies, 71 percent of all adolescent drug and alcohol abuse, 80 percent of all prison inmates, and 90 percent of all homeless and runaway children. And what we've got is a situation, we actually did some research, we went into the elementary school and uh, middle school and randomly polled a first grade class. 80% of the kids in that class, and we're talking a nice middle class school, 80% mm -hmm. of those first graders were coming from broken homes, only living with one or no biological 80%. parent. 80%. That's, that's incredible. Now we did a sixth grade class, 65% of the kids coming from broken homes, but the teacher, extra enthusiastic, said, let me check the gifted class, because now she's thinking about, does this have an impact on, mm -hmm. on children mm -hmm. and their behavior and ability to learn? In the gifted class, 85% of the kids are living with both mom and dad. Now, There has to be a correlation. Oh, absolutely a correlation. <laughs> yeah, now, children yeah. who don't feel safe and stressed have a hard time learning, and the broken home, as you can see, causes all these problems. And I want to read you just a little story here because I had to wonder, what does divorce feel like? I was not a child of divorce, were you? No. Okay. So I didn't know what it felt like, so I had to go find a child <laughs> and say, what does it feel like to be a child of divorce? Mm -hmm. And I want to introduce you briefly to Katie. It says, Katie remembers the day her parents said they were getting a divorce. It totally turned my world upside down. I'd never known anything different, but mom and dad always being together. My brother and I blamed ourselves. We asked, what did we do? We were angry. It took years for me to learn to let go of that pain. Now, you know what's so interesting, Jay? She was 28 years old, a full-grown adult with a fully developed set of coping skills when she experienced this, and yet she experienced it, if you noticed, as pain and self-blame. Mm -hmm. So when you take now that the American dream is now gone, uh, most kids are not being raised with a mom and a dad and a brother or a sister and a dog or a cat. Most kids now are being raised in a broken home. Yeah. 
And well, that has to be increasing because I can remember yeah. in school, you know, we knew all of our friends and yeah. they didn't. Uh, they were, there weren't that many broken homes, certainly nowhere near yes. 50%. Yes. You know? yeah. Well, see, we lived during the time when it was the American sure. dream, you know, sure. the typical, yeah. uh, a very solid, stable family unit. Well, but and that's also, not too, I think, and, and this is not an indictment because it's an economic necessity, but uh, when we were growing up or when I was growing up, there weren't nearly as many two income families. I mean, yes. the, the mother in most cases, or in many cases, stayed home yes. and took care of the kids. And now both parents almost have to work and they're gone. And yes. so often, you know, kids come home in the afternoon to an empty house. Right. And, and that's, that's a serious issue as well. I think. Well, and actually there's been studies on that. And most of the first time drug abuse, first sexual experimentation, uh, first alcohol abuse, vandalism, happens between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. when during that little window of time when the kids get out of school and mom and dad aren't home from work yet mm -hmm. and so there's been studies that if uh, after school activities or programs can be put in place some programs some schools have programs in other states where actually there's something for those children to do till the parents can come pick them up various things in the gym or art music activities like that they can almost close that window uh, by taking that time uh, where kids would normally be unsupervised and giving them not only supervision, but fun things to do. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads us in directly to a discussion, I think, of what uh, one of the things that you said you want to talk about, and that is parents do have a responsibility, and there are things that parents can do. And you summarize it in, in your book as, as myths. Yes. And I think you had about five myths. And so let's talk about those a little bit. The, okay. the first myth was parents are powerless. Yes. Uh, that, that certainly isn't the case. There's a lot that parents can do. Yes. And so one of the things parents feel like, they really do feel powerless nowadays. They feel like I talk to my children, they don't listen, my teenagers aren't listening to me. And yet it's interesting that even parental expectation makes a difference. So nowadays, most parents feel it's unlikely that my teen's gonna get all the way through his teenage years without ever experimenting with drugs. Mm -hmm. If that's your attitude as a parent, your child is 300 times more likely to experiment and to uh, perhaps use drugs even beyond experimenting than a child whose parent says using drugs in this house is unacceptable if you use drugs there will be consequences some parents are actually going to you know at Walmart for $12 you can buy a little drug testing kit right. and for $40 you can buy a much more sophisticated that will check for the over-the-counter but you set that on the refrigerator and you tell your children periodically you're going to pee in this cup and and uh, they might say well you don't trust me and it's like no I'm being a responsible parent and in 2012 this is what it means to be a responsible parent and so uh, even your expectation can affect your child's um, decision whether or not to experiment let alone parents who actually go the next step sit down and have a conversation go on the internet look at what someone looks like before they start using meth and two years later unbelievable how it can destroy the body let alone the the soul you know the inner person um, and so sit down and, and talk to your child and let your child know and let them do their own research and let them sift through and find some of their own answers so kids don't want to be told no it's bad it's wrong they want to know why what's it going to do to me what are my options and then talk about peer pressure and the parents that go that extra mile and actually do research and sit down with their kids and work with them then the and, and then help your child build a life they love those kinds of things you're drug proofing a child but to yeah, that is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad uh, owned a funeral home, and at that time, the funeral homes had to operate the ambulances. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the programs that we were involved in was when, when, to keep uh, kids from uh, drinking and driving. We'd actually bring them over and show them pictures of crashes and things that had result from, resulted from people driving under the influence. And that was a very, very powerful That is program. very, very yeah. powerful. And it ties in with what you're saying. Show them what the brain looks like when it's fried and the yes. behavior and things like that. Yeah, that can be yes. very powerful. And that's something parents can do. Yes. And, you know, nowadays there are programs on TV yeah. about uh, people who use drugs and what the outcomes are. Our former police chief, who's now retired, Neil Stockton, his daddy, when he was a boy, he w his dad was police chief. And his dad would bring him pictures and say, this is what happens when you drink and drive. And he'd show him a man crashed into a bridge. Yeah. And the pictures were quite explicit. Like but he said he never did drugs. And I think he said he didn't have his first drink till he was like 24, just because he did not want those kinds of problems. He respected his dad, and his dad helped him draw his own conclusion. I don't want that mess in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what parents can do. There's a lot that parents can do. 
second myth was that uh, children need to make mistakes in yes. order to learn, yeah. yeah. Yes, so this is uh, an extremely pervasive myth. And what it says is that your child, Jay, or your grandchild now, has a right to a self-directed childhood and let them make their own choices. And when they get in too deep and they start to drown, you go in there and you rescue them. But do not rob them of their right to have a self-guided childhood. Well, that is the recipe for disaster. Oh, absolutely. And uh, children who, and, and actually 70% of kids nowadays are being raised in this, under this myth mode of I'm being a good parent by giving my child this freedom. So it ends up there was a study done, and there are actually 10 rules that uh, parents can uh, put into their households. And if they have, there's 12 rules that, that have been studied. And if you choose 10 of these rules and put them in your household, you are a hands-on parent. And your child has an excellent chance of staying drug-free. If you choose six of these rules, you're a half-hearted parent. If you have five or less, which 70% of people in Greensboro and Kernersville and all across America, your child is at high risk for substance abuse. Well, we've got time. Share those with us. Okay. Well, let's take, for instance, the first rule. Uh, monitor what your teens do on the Internet. Now that's a protective rule. Mm -hmm. And you and I talked before about what a blessing and what a curse the yeah, internet is. It is both. Because kids can get into more trouble that fast. They can see things that can corrupt their minds so quickly. And then it almost becomes a sport of one-upmanship and uh, seeing more and more corrupt things. And next thing you know, kids are headed down a wrong path. Mm -hmm. uh, put restrictions on the music CDs that teens buy. And it's interesting, later on in here is a, is a study about kids who do end up getting into drugs and alcohol tend to gravitate towards rap and heavy metal music. Yes. And they say, why is that? Well, the reason why is because these are kids with uh, low self-identity, low self-worth. You listen to the music, you get your hairstyle, you get your peer group. Without ever having to try and become, you know, to find your skills and become a useful person, you all of a sudden can fit right in. Yep, so, so you have to watch what music your teens are, are putting into their minds. It says know where your teens are after school and on weekends. And again, we talked about that little window of time between when the kids get out of school and mom and dad get home. Mm -hmm. That's when a lot of this mischief happens. Yep. Expect to be and are told the truth by your teen where they really are going. And again, that calls for monitoring. And if they say they're going to Johnny's house, call Johnny's mom and say, hey, did Mark make it there yet? And it's like, no, Mark's never been here and, and my son's actually gone. And then you confront your child and you have some accountability and some consequences there. Uh, another tip. Uh, parents are very aware of their teen's academic performance. Some parents get a little confused and think, you know, when a child goes into high school, it's time to let them have the reins and let them prove what they are and learn to be responsible. And really, the, a better rule of thumb is when you're driving the car, when you're staying on the road, then you can take the wheel completely. And still, parents need to monitor because kids can get distracted and lazy and off track. So stay involved. That way they know it's important. Impose a curfew. A lot of kids, they make the rules. Yeah. I'll be in after 12, so don't wait up for me. <laughs> That's not a hands-on, responsible parent that allows that. It says, make clear they would, that you would be extremely upset if your teen used pot. So this is exactly the opposite of a parent who says, I know you're probably going to do it, so tell me when you do. There are actually parents who say, if you want to experiment, let's just do it together. Or let me buy it so I make sure it's not laced with something bad. Those parents are not being responsible. They're actually breaking the law, setting themselves up for heartbreak down the line. Um, eat dinner with your teens almost every night. Now this is interesting because this reduces drug abuse. And the reason why is when we eat dinner together, it's not that we're just like you're making sure your children are getting all their nutrition, it's we're bonding. Yeah. So at the dinner table, we talk about our problems, our successes, we laugh, we cry, we get reminded to get our elbows off the table, and so we're bonding as a family unit. Another one, monitor what teens watch on TV, and nowadays with cable, TV and the internet are so closely related in, and thank goodness they are rating things now. But you actually have to be monitoring your children, right. not just uh, depending on them to say, well, I'm 13, this is uh, TV 14. Yeah. Parents have to monitor that. Here's a big one. Turn off the TV during dinner. <clears throat> so if we're just sitting around the table and not talking and eating, it's, the magic's not happening. Right. We're not connecting as a family. 
Assign the teen regular chores, and I like this. I had regular chores when I was a teen. Did you? Absolutely. What was your chore? Oh, gosh, I had to mow the yard. Well, in fact, in my day, we didn't have a washing machine, so one of my chores was to take the laundry down to the local laundromat yes. and wash it and dry it and then lug it back home and sort it and clean it and even iron it. Oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. 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 Was... Well, you're, you, you turned out to be a role model guy. Yeah. <laughs> you worked harder than I did, and I thought we had a garden, like, seemed to be 10 acres big that I had to work in the garden. And then we rotated dishes and uh, meal preparation and we basically learned how to run a household before we got out of there. That's not happening nowadays, but the thing with teen chores isn't so much that your mom and dad are saying, well, Jay's going to take care of all the laundry. You were learning accountability. Like if you got a little rushed and you started ironing wrinkles in your dad's shirt, I'm sure there was a problem. <laughs> yeah. There's some accountability yeah, there. Right, yes. Exactly, sure. So we learn accountability, we learn work ethic, and that prepares us for, excuse me, for adulthood. The last one is have an adult present when the teen returns from school. And even if you can't be there, can you pay a neighbor to come over and check in, maybe get a snack, have a little conversation, even if they can't stay there the whole time, can you get somebody there to greet your teen? And it's interesting, I've talked to kids who sometimes mom had to work part time, but mm -hmm. mostly she's a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. And during the few weeks out of the year where she would work, maybe around the holiday season where there'd be more work available, they got into so much mischief and were fighting and breaking all kinds of rules because no one was there. And as soon as mom's job ended and she was back there, everything's like, okay, got to behave ourselves. Well, it clearly makes a difference. There's no question. But, you know, one another thing that I think is, is a problem in, in today's society is too many parents try to be friends rather than parents. Yes. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, a serious mistake. Kids don't need their parents to be their buddies. They need them to be their parents. That's exactly right. And so that's something where, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure where that comes from, but it's tough being a parent. Yes, and is. I used to tell my kids, my job isn't for you to like me. My job is to do whatever it takes for me to get you to do what you need to do. And that's what my job description is. And your job is to do what you're told and, you know, to do the best job mm -hmm. you can do. Well, and I think it pays off because I know so many cases where the parent, the, the kids, when they, were, when they were growing up, they thought the parents were the meanest people on earth. But yes. later they came back and said, you know, you were right. Yes, because they're still on a path of maturity. Mm -hmm. And they see their friends that were let on the loose. Uh, drug addicts, can't hold down a job, three or four marriages basically having troubles. But I'd like to tell you one cute story. Uh, when I was a stockbroker in another lifetime, there was a gal in the office and uh, we talked for a little bit and she said, you know, when I was a kid, I was one of those rebel kids and I got into trouble all the time and I'd break my curfew and come in late and my mom and dad would never uh, give me a consequence and I felt like they didn't love me. Mm -hmm. And she said, one time I did something really bad and they took away my car keys. And she said, you know how I felt? She said, I thought, now I know they care. Unfortunately, she threw a bloody tantrum and they gave her back her car oh, keys. Yeah. But what we, what, our, what we think our children are asking and what they really need, they want structure and boundaries. And we have to be mature enough to say, they're putting me to the test, but I need to be the adult here. And one day they'll thank me. So that's, that's what parents Absolutely. can work towards. We're going to need another show to get through some of these other things because I think they're very important. But I want to take the last couple of minutes that we have and ask you about the progress of your uh, of your program. Uh, KCK, Kernersville Cares for Kids, started out in, in the local school there in Kernersville. And, and I know that recently you've been um, talking with some other folks in some other municipalities, I think even including Greensboro, to maybe expand the program into some other areas. Absolutely. So I'm scheduled over the next two weeks to talk to some officials right here in Greensboro, uh, one of them in the school system. System. I know uh, for a fact, I've been speaking at several civic clubs in Greensboro here too, and some of the civic clubs have written letters to the uh, various town officials saying, hey, why can't we get something like this for our kids? Because kids in Greensboro are no different than kids anyplace else. They need support now. They need to know if they get off the path, there's a program in place where they can get free help, police are never called, doesn't affect their school, their, their, you know, their school records, mm -hmm. their peers don't find out. All they're going to do is get free help to get back on track and be, get, get their lives moving forward again. And you know, it can be paid for by, in Kernersville it was for years, by money confiscated from illegal drug sales. So it's not like a big money problem. It's only a matter of a community saying, hey, this is alive. It's been going on for 15 years in Forsyth County. Can it work here? Well, others need to hear about the success that you've had because the program in, in Forsyth County, in Kernersville in particular, has been very, very successful. I mean, yes. you've reached so many kids. 
I don't know how many thousands, but I, I know it's it's been in the thousands of kids that you've gotten to sign the voluntary pledges and yes. the other aspects of the program. Yes. So in Kernersville, typically about 85% of the high school kids and about 90% of the middle school kids voluntarily sign up for this program. Yeah. And so we've got some incentives, we've got some things, because you and I like incentives too. We like to get a discount oh, if sure. we sign up for something. We give the kids incentives. We make them special. We put the kids in the newspaper. We put posters up in town that says, we respect our drug-free students. So we applaud our kids. We give them what they want. They want attention. They want respect. They, they want partnership. And that's what we give them. And this town could do it too. Fascinating and most important topic. And uh, I suspect we'll do this again before too long because there's a lot more to cover and a lot of a lot more that needs to be heard. But again, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Patty Josephel, who is the uh, founding director, I guess we would say, of Kernersville Cares for Kids and now expanding that program to other areas. Thank you so much for what you're doing and thank you for being on the program. Thank you, Jay. And we thank you as always for watching our program. Greensboro Community Television.